Welcome to episode 70 of The Brainstorm. We've got Nemo with us from our genomics team. You know, normally, Nick, we're talking autonomous cars, sometimes DeFi, but now we've got autonomous labs and DSI. Nemo, what on earth do those things mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So the kind of big picture statement here is that autonomous and decentralized science can truly disrupt the drug discovery process. And so obviously I'm not making a bold statement here. We we kind of really understand that the drug discovery as a process is fundamentally inefficient and flawed. And so how can we actually change that? And so first we are gonna start with explaining what is actually autonomous science. And so basically when we talk about autonomous science, you should think about kind of game-changing blend of the AI and the robotics that promises us to kind of change how the research is done. And so think about like a self-driving car of the lab world where AI agents and robotic systems together working successfully and doing scientific experiments. And so it is also important to note why we are talking about this now. So this is not some future. This is already already happening. So two weeks ago, there was a paper from Stanford from James O. Group where they actually developed a virtual lab. Uh, and in that virtual lab, they used kind of AI agents, which kind of coordinated like a real research team where you have a, a PI, which is a principal investigator, you have PhD students, you have postdocs, and they have all different kind of functions. And their task was to develop a antibody from scratch for SARS-CoV-2. And they have done that in the record timeline. And also they came, they've developed some 92 different antibodies. And two of those were actually better than the current antibodies that exist already in the market for the SARS-CoV-2. Wait, so, so Nima, just to understand, so I get, right, you train the AI, ask questions, it forces the non-PI PhD students to work way harder than it and get less credit. Uh, and then uh, who, who sets up the autonomous lab, right? So it's like, it, it, to me, it makes sense. It seems like a lab is a much more constrained environment, almost like a factory, factory automation. So I imagine there's human intervention and they're like, okay, this is what the AI decided yeah. we should test. Then you set it up and then it's exactly. just like a assembly line. It's like they're automated. Doing yeah. So whatever. basically uh, the person, I, uh, I'm not sure was it a PhD student or a postdoc who was in charge of this project. That person actually sets up AI agents who are going to have a different kind of functions in, in this virtual lab. So one AI agent is going to be high behave as a principal investigator who is kind of controlling everything. Or there is going to be a immunologist because they're developing antibodies. Other one is going to be a bioinformatician or computational biologist who is going to actually do that kind of part of the research. And the key here was that the person in the loop was actually having kind of individual meetings with all the agents, give them the, the task, and then kind of meet with them again to see where they are. And they also had a, like a group meetings once per week where they kind of discuss the progress. So the person is actually kind of directing all of them in doing different parts of the of the task. And you know. Something like this for our regular PhD students would be a whole PhD work to develop antibody, I guess. And we're talking about four or five years of work because, you know, I, I'm a computational biologist, but like then I need to kind of partner with someone who is more on the wet side of the lab. I need to kind of bring, maybe if I need to validate some data, I need to partner with someone who is in the clinic and actually can give me the samples. And so here we are kind of replacing all those kind of uh, people with kind of AI agents who can do the work for us. And then additionally, executing experiments as well. Okay, so the first, this was the first of its kind, you think, from Stanford? Yeah, so, yeah, well, in academia, this is kind of first kind of showing that there is a kind of virtual lab. We have seen these things, for example, I have seen on Twitter, there are multiple examples of people actually writing the books in this, where they have like 10 different kind of AI agents. One is going to be kind of focused on narrative, other is kind of focusing, focusing that, you know, there is no duplication, checking some other things that they're not kind of copying. Um, but... You know, this was the kind of first showing in the in the academic setting. Though something like this, we have been seen in, with one of our companies, Recursion. So Recursion in January actually presented their LLM uh, system called Low, which basically enables them to kind of build this lab in the loop. And so basically, their self-driving lab kind of uses their kind of proprietary uh, LLM, which is called Low, and uh, uh, that system helps them to kind of hypothesize experiment and analyze the data and all in a continuous automated loop. 
and by the, kind of by the medic, by dynamically are kind of refining experiments. And you know, they the recursion before this system had about thirty six kind of people involved in this process. Now it's only two kind of people kind of overseeing all of that kind of process. How much do you think that this speeds up drug discovery and drug creation? Well, so uh, again, I'm just going to use the kind of recursion as an example. You know, recursion now in this kind of process can go from this from the target ID, where that's the first step in their discovery, to having the kind of drug candidate for the clinical studies in just a couple of weeks and for a couple of millions. This before would be a kind of new biotech uh, founded in in the venture community and put like two hundred million dollars into this. And now we're wow. doing this a couple of weeks for a couple of millions. Bam. Wow. So what, what would, yeah. And what would be, uh, you know, what would be the biggest hurdle then, uh, you know, you have more drugs being discovered. Are there, you know, steps where AI can help down the value chain, assuming, you know, once you have it, there's more than just discovering it, right. You have to go through all the hoops of the FDA and, and I'm not entirely sure, but maybe you can highlight what happens after and where there's more improvements to come. Yeah. So obviously the next, the, the biggest kind of cost spend is actually in the clinical trials. So we can have the first step, you know, you do target ID, you develop a drug, you do preclinical studies, and then you go to clinical trials. So in clinical trials, that's the, where it's the most expensive and it takes the most time. Uh, and so there's a couple of things that there need, could be happening and, uh, and are happening. So first of all, FDA kind of being more open for streamlining innovation. You know, like, can we ima- imagine the f- future? If I had a kind of this lab in the loop, which kind of builds on the foundational model, and I come up with one drug, which is approved, do I need the clinical trials for other drug? Can, can we just have if the foundational model works and it's approved already, can we actually speed up some of the process? So that's one of the ways that FDA could be kind of actually changing this. Other kind of approaches, and there are companies in this space, one of them is Unlearn AI, which are basically de- developing kind of digital twins, which significantly reduces the number of the patients needed in the clinical trials. Because a huge part of why the clinical trials are so expensive, because you're actually paying those, paying those patients. And so first you have to find them, and then you kind of, you're kind paying them. And so with, uh, with Unlearn AI, they have already shown that they can, at least in the control group, they can basically reduce the number of the patients to one-fifth of what is already needed. And idea is that, you know, we'll be able to kind of create the digital twins, which would eventually completely replace the clinical trials, which would be, you know, having these two things together would be like uh, really boom, 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 boom. But that seems uh, like that's further out, right? Yes, it's like that's-, yes, that's further out. Um, that's definitely further, further out. So we are still kind of focused on this first piece. And so, and I also, I just talked about, I just talked about autonomous science, but there is a now another layer that we kind of had to kind of add here which is decentralized science. And so what do we think actually by that? So add to this autonomous lab uh, blockchain technology. And what this actually happens is that when we kind of bridge kind of blockchain with this autonomous lab, we are, we are kind of, the decentralized the, the science is basically introducing transparency, collaboration, and kind of equitable access. And there are companies, again, on the private side, which are already doing this company like Molecule, they are definitely leading the, the charge. And they use the kind of blockchain blaze, uh, based IP, which are wrapped in NFTs to kind of fund the, the research and to share the IPs. And this is happening. Uh, and um, I think they have about 34 projects are funded now because we, with this side, we actually want to remove the centralization because now a lot of research is, is defined by NIH or other grants. And, you know, there is a lot of research that is not actually getting attention. So anyone in the world through Molecule can actually find the research that they are interested in and then get the share of their IP. And other thing important here, um, you know, this is not just like some kind of, you know, <laughs> crypto people doing it. Pfizer actually invested four point two Pfizer Ventures invested 4.1 million in VitaDAO, which is kind of part of the molecule. Uh, and they're just focusing on the kind of aging. And so the, the future that I want to see is like, I have this autonomous science. I have this kind of decentralized science together. How they change the drug discovery? You know, can we think about drug discovery almost like an app store where people throughout the world kind of using the blockchain to kind of have the kind of put the money or the funding and then the, get the part of the IP and actually push for the certain uh, part of the research to develop the drugs? Wow, that was a lot of <laughs> in both convergence. I'd say both convergence and buzzwords. 
And yeah, so it's, it's, it's happening. It's like a, a combination of excitement and also my knee jerk reaction is like, okay, this seems like we got to be cautious too, right? It's like as soon as you say NFT drug discovery, I was like, oh boy. But it also sounds like, maybe, you know, there have been times in the past where you have a certain sector or country that just kind of leapfrogs in terms of onboarding into new technology. And I think, you know, having listened to the genomics team over the years, it seems like this space has been very much stuck in the past. And now maybe it's finally that, you know, we're starting to wake up or, you know, these scientists are starting to realize the power of unlocking and decentralizing and AI and everything Nemo just mentioned. And now they're just kind of leapfrogging, you know, this, the steps that they could have taken and just jumping right to, you know, the future that we've been talking about. I would say that healthcare compared to the, a lot of other industries, it's almost like the time in the classical music and Mozart and those were guys that were doing it and stuff. So it's just some, some pe- few people are doing it and they can kind of perform it only live and you can only go and listen it like that. Versus like right now, like, you know, there's Spotify, like how we listen and share the music. Healthcare is still stuck in those kind of ages of kind of very kind of stochastic, um, you know, not industrialized at all. And, it, and, you know, this is not putting blame on anyone. Like healthcare is difficult because biology complexity is huge and it's really hard to do what, what they have been doing already. But we need to move from this kind of kind of um, medieval ages to the actual 21st century. All right. Yeah. Nemo, you invited the question. Who is the Mozart of uh, genomics? Ooh. Um, who is the most? Um, okay. I'm Company say- or person. Company yeah, or person. Okay. Uh, company, there are two companies that are Mozart's, Recursion and Tempest. Uh, but person who's, who's a Mozart for me, and he's actually not a genomics person, it's Balaji Srinivasan. He's thinking about this space and how f- forward he's thinking and going with this. And even on the D side front is what makes me a motor for me. Mm-hmm. As a, from a composition standpoint, almost. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. That's the right uh, comparison. Nice. Nice. Wow. So exciting. I feel like to me, it also rings true somewhat with space to although space less so now because so many people are excited about it. But it's like it's not in your everyday life. So it's hard for people to comprehend what's going on and what's happening. Um, but it's also, you know, it is interesting to hear Pfizer's making investments in this. Obviously, that's good to hear. They're a huge company. They've got lots of resources. So four million is not, not huge, but it certainly shows it's on their radar. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, it, for me, just I do like seeing those kind of, you know, um, big, big players who are not really driving the innovation usually in the in the in the drug discovery kind of noticing this and actually kind of backing up some of these approaches and have I, you have yeah. you partook in any desi have what are you uh, what are you brewing yeah. up uh, well i uh, i'm i'm a huge fan of molecule um and what they're doing um, um and so i i think that uh, it's really gonna remove the centralization part of the of the funding of the research in academia, and then it will kind of move to a drug discovery kind of space, you know, and, and there is actually another component here to also to kind of just kind of flag is, you know, we have seen now AlphaFold3 and Google DeepMind open sourcing that NVIDIA just open sourced its all BioNemo framework, which is like multiple different computational tools, you know, uh, for the drug discovery, which enables academia to actually have easy access to that. You know, th- th- that was also a huge problem. You know, academia generally has a not doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, and so this kind of open sourcing that I'm seeing as well, it's going to give me a positive kind of, um, hindsight that actually this is going to come sooner than we think. Nemo, you mentioned two companies, Recursion and Tempest. I think you, you talked a bit about what Recursion does, but maybe just high level overview of what each do in the space and what makes them the most Mozart, Mozarts of the time. Absolutely. So Recursion is a kind of real true kind of tech by a company, which you kind of, has been really focusing from the day one, how do we industrialize the drug discovery process? And so they have been mostly focusing on the first piece, which is the target ID and validation. And they just now acquired Existencia, which was focusing on the drug development kind of piece. And so now the, we have these two engines together and they're the first one kind of using the AI advanced robotics to kind of do basically to make this kind of lab in the loop or self-driving loop concept kind of comes to the, to the life. Um, and so that's the recursion. 
Tempest is coming from this pers- other pers- perspective, kind of really focusing on the diagnostics. And, you know, when we think about diagnostics today, usually you're kind of very sick and then they do some test on you and then it's like a binary, it, you're sick or not, you have this disease or not. And Tempest is like, no, there is much more big data to be collected using the sequencing and other methods. And because we can collect much more data, we can move from this kind of diagnostics, you know, do you have it or not, to be prognostics and, pre- and, uh, and predictive, which means like I can actually tell you what's going to be happening and I can also tell you what kind of therapies are you going to be responding to. And so that's why like they are completely reimagining what is actually the space of the di- diagnostics, really focusing on the kind of big data and, uh, and AI uh, kind of together. Amazing. Nemo, thank you for joining us and uh, opening our eyes to a exciting future. Yeah, very exciting. It was, it was, it was a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you.